Let me introduce you our granddad, Paul. Paul is the granddad of my husband, and he lived 102 years. On the photo, you see him with his great-granddaughter, Clara, my niece, at his 102nd birthday. People as old as Paul are very rare in Germany, and mayors come to congratulate them on their jubilees. And Paul even had three such visits from two different mayors. Now, when Clara, my niece, will reach her 100th birthday in January 2099, centenarians will be completely normal. Every second woman of Clara's age will reach 100 years. Each day, our, your, mine life expectancy increases for five hours. Every decade, we are given two to three additional years. The United Nations even dare to forecast when the first country on Earth will have at least one million centenarians. Not Japan, currently the country with the oldest people on Earth. China will take the prize, and it will be around the year 2069. When Clara reaches her 100th birthday, already five nations on Earth will have one million centenarians each. Among these three, China, the United States, and India will have close to two million centenarians. So this, our century, is the century of long life, the century of the centenarians. But how do we live such a hundred year life? Not as an exception like Granddad Paul, but as the rule. Do you want to live a hundred years? Well, I do. And it turns out I happen to be quite well prepared to do so. I didn't know that when I started my research into this longevity revolution almost a decade ago. I was 43 at that time and political editor of a large national daily. I was on the verge of uh, publishing a best-selling account of Chancellor Angela Merkel's navigating the financial crisis of 2008. But there was this new editor-in-chief and he decided he wanted his own political editor. Guess what? I was out. At first, I was devastated, but then I thought, maybe it's a signal. Maybe it's time to move out of my comfort zone. After all, for the 20 years of my being a journalist thus far, I'd be changing either jobs or subjects to report on every couple of years. And I was really deeply unhappy about the negative way this longevity revolution was portrayed at that time in Germany. It was seen almost only as this wave of old people, this great tsunami that was wrecking the social system, welfare system, and uh, the state. I beg to differ. Isn't it wonderful that we can all live so much longer? But to really use this gift of longer life, these additional years, we do have to challenge a couple of well-worn tenets that we hold, assumptions that we hold about our life, about our brain health, and about happiness. And we have to move out of our comfort zones. So how do we do it, the 100-year life? Can we be happy? How do we work? Let's start with happiness. In 2010, American scientists asked more than 340,000 Americans about their personal well-being at that special point in their lives. It turns out that happiness follows a U-band. From a high in your 20s, it goes all the way down. Anybody here on the verge of celebrating your 46th birthday today, this year? Maybe you want to close your eyes for two seconds because you are approaching the absolute low of your happiness curve. 46 is rock bottom in personal well-being.
Now, this is statistics, of course. But a study has been reciprocated all over the world in different countries, rich or poor, Eastern or Western. And the U-band has been found everywhere. So how come the second half of life we feel even happier than in the first half? Well, for one thing, we are not rookies anymore. We've been through quite a lot. We managed things better or worse, but we manage them. And Stanford psychologist Laura Corstensen thinks that people in their second half of life display something she calls socio-emotional selectivity. Because of our experience, we now know better what's good for us and we behave accordingly. So happiness might really be an asset in the 100-year life. Let's move to work. I recently met the owner of a car components manufacturer and his business was going really well, but he was livid. And it was the millennials he was raging against. These millennials, he told me. When they come to the job interview, the first thing they ask is sabbaticals and part-time work. I think this is great. In doing so, millennials are laying the absolute necessary foundations for their 100-year life. They know that work will change dramatically and they demand from their employers to adapt accordingly. Life so far had three stages, growing up and learning, working and resting. Life for the millennials will have a multitude of stages. Learning, working, and resting will happen throughout the whole trajectory of your life, intermittently. Many will work more than one job, as job descriptions in the digital age change frequently. Learning will be a constant feature of life. And it's obvious that resting has to be an integral part of the 100-year life. So far, only very few companies have adapted to that change. And I'm afraid we, we, you, we have to fight for it. Like that engineer who works in a family-owned company, a large one, in southern Germany. Already a couple of years ago, he goes to his boss. Boss, he says, I need a break. I want to go motorcycling for four months in the United States. The boss looks at him. What? Motorcycling? Four months? He's incredulous, irritated, irate. He flatly denies the request. So the engineer goes to the boss of the boss, a woman in this case, the daughter of the company founder. She listens. She thinks about it. She decides. The company changes their time management system into one where each employee can choose their own working hours within a corridor from 15 to 40 work hours and where they all can save up work time for sabbaticals of up to two years. Now, I talked to the HR person who was in charge of this transition. And he told me when he went to management with the new system, they were absolutely raging. They thought this could never work. Anarchy would ensue if everybody chooses their own working times. And indeed, in the first couple of weeks, they did have problems because after all, this company really went out of their comfort zone. Within a couple of months, though, things were going better than ever. The company was flooded with job applications from that group everybody seeks, the millennials. And that was because they seemed to have understood and showed that with their new time system, a central tenet of work in a hundred year life. What we want from work, our demands from work change during the course of our lifetime. When we are young and just starting work, we want to show what we can do, work many hours, start our careers. 
then there might be a family phase where we want to drive our working time down again. At some point, the kids are out of the house. We might want to increase it again. And our demand for work changes along our lifetime. And there is this additional thing. In giving their workers autonomy over the work time, the company showed a huge amount of appreciation for their workforce. Now, both autonomy and appreciation for your work are not only huge motivators, they are central tenants of work in the 100-year life. Without them, working seven or even more decades might be literally unworkable. With it, it's a welcome start into this 100-year life. Now we're reaching the maybe most important question of all this. Isn't this second half of life supposed to continue slide downwards? Memory is fading, strength is decreasing, hair is getting gray. Well, I might have some good news for you. Let's start with our bodies. Couch potatoes can get fit at any age. They just have to start. Faucha Singh, the first 100-year-old to complete a marathon, did his first run at age 89. And there's an additional plus. If you start moving yourself, physical activity will literally activate your brain. Learning will become a lot easier while moving. A little bit more tricky is the question about the brain, and that's because well into the 80s of the last century, scientific opinion was that our brains develop and then at some point just stop and degenerate. And scientific discussion was only when that point would be already at 50, at 70, at 90. No consensus was reached, and that was good. Because nowadays, as we can look into our brains with things such as MRTs and CTs and see what's really going on there, we know this is complete nonsense. Barring neurodegenerative diseases, our brains change as long as we live. They are what the scientists call malleable, and they speak about the plasticity of the brain. When you leave this lovely place tonight, your brain is going to be different than it was this morning. And tomorrow morning, after you've slept and dreamt, it's going to be different all again, and the next morning. So learning will be able throughout the whole lifetime. And the saying that old dogs don't learn new tricks does definitely not apply to humans. We can learn as long as we live. However, young people learn differently than old people. Young people soak up new knowledge like a sponge because they never know when they will need it. And the scientists call that the fluid intelligence. Older people, having been through a much more, have something that is called crystalline intelligence. Their brains have become very good at judging new knowledge and, and only acting when they know it's good for them. So if you are the boss of silver-haired workers and you just send them off to draining without telling them what's good for, they probably won't go for it. So this crystalline intelligence I call the diamond in your head. It gleams and shines all throughout the second half of your life if you take good care and polish it. So we're now at the most important thing about brain health in the second half of your life. And that is that your brain can either be your best friend or your worst enemy. Age is just a construct in your brain. Join me for a little experiment. This half of the room, you're just going to close your eyes for two seconds and only open them when I wave. Okay? Do it. Quick. Don't cheat. 
This half, I just tell you three words, old, sick, demented, okay? Great, ears open. Everybody, please get up from your seats for a second. Shake a little bit, you know, physical activity. Sit down again, thank you so much. If we would have scientists in that room, they would be interested in only one number, and that is how fast you got up from your seat. And this half, with their ears closed, if you didn't cheat, no matter how old or young, fit or unfit you are, would have won the contest clear cut. And that is because of the three words with which I primed this part of the audience. What did I say to you? Old, sick, demented. Three negative, three negative stereotypes about aging and they did the trick they were supposed to do. You are not at fault, it's not your fault. But these three negative age stereotypes subconsciously made you behave accordingly. And you got up, no matter how young or old, fit or unfit, slightly, slightly, it took you more time. Milliseconds, but measurable nonetheless. Experiments of that type have been repeated all over the world, and they all confirm this enormous effect of age stereotyping. And this leads to but one conclusion. Age is just a construct in your brain. Your brains are either your best friend or your worst enemy. If you fight age stereotyping, if you accept age stereotyping, if you accept it, you will feel old. If you fight age stereotyping, age will become irrelevant. If you want to live a long and happy life, you have to move out of your comfort zone.